I'd just like to say welcome to everybody. Thank you. Uh, this is our, our first attempt at doing an afternoon of Poetry Please. Uh, I'm sure some of you have listened to Poetry Please on the radio when the presenter in, invites a well-known person to discuss their um, most favourite poems. Now, I'm afraid we haven't got a well-known person to join us this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but many of you have volunteered uh, to read poems, so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I know that Mari needs to leave early, and, and she is keen to read her favourite poem to us, which is Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas. So, Mari, shall I hand over to you to do that so that you can then leave? Right, fine. Thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Good, good. Yes, well, it's lovely to be in a new 3A meeting again. I really feel part of it, and I feel as if I'm, well, cutching up with you all. It's lovely. <laughs> so thank you so much for making the opportunity. And I'm so sorry I can't listen to all the other contributors this afternoon, but I do have to take my cat to the vet again. She's got major gastric problems. Oh. Right. Now, this is my favorite poem of all time. Dylan Thomas's Fern Hill. And Mike Stevens, whom you may have heard of, said that it was justifiably one of Dylan Thomas's best loved poems. It was written in 1945, and it was about Fern Hill, the farm of his Aunt Anne Jones in Sangine. And he used to go there for his summer holidays. And obviously, he had a whale of a time. And he was a boy amongst boys, as only a boy can be in the summer. And that summer seemed to last forever. But I'll read you the poem, and then I'll just make a couple of comments about it. And then I'm afraid I'll have to leave you. Fern Hill. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs about the lilting house, and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry, time let me hail and climb golden in the heydays of his eyes, and honoured among wagons I was prince of the apple towns, and once before a time I lonely had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall night. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the barns, among the happy yard, and singing as the farm was home in the sun that is young once only, time let me play and be golden in the mercy of his means. And green and golden, I was huntsman and herdsman. The calves sang to my horn. The foxes on the hills barked clear and cold. And the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. All the sun long, it was running, it was lovely. The hay fields high as the house. The tunes from the chimneys. It was air and playing, lovely and watery, and fire green as grass, and the night lay under the single stars. As I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away. All the moon long, I heard blessed among stables the night jars flying with the ricks, and the horses flashing into the dark. And then to awake, and the farm like a wanderer white with the dew come back. The cock on his shoulder, it was all shining, it was Adam and Maiden. The sky gathered again, and the sun grew round that very day. So it must have been, after the birth of the simple light, in the first spinning place, the spellbound horses walking warm out of the whinnying green stable onto the fields of praise. And honoured among foxes and pheasants by the gay house under the new-made cloud, and happy as the heart was long in the sun born over and over, I ran my heedless ways. 
my wishes raced through the house, hi hey, and nothing I cared at my sky blue trains that time allows in all his tuneful turning, so few and such morning songs before the children green and golden follow him out of grace. Nothing I cared in the lamb-white days that time would take me up to the swallow thronged loft by the shadow of my hand in the moon that is always rising, nor that riding to sleep I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, Time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. It is beautiful. It is so lyrical. And to me, all those images of green and golden are not just the images of childhood and sunshine and a long, long, never-ending summer on the farm, but the, the prelude to something else as well, mortality, aren't they? Because even in our youth, the seeds are sown for our mortality. And Dylan Thomas bore this in mind in so many of his poems. So it's not just a poem of artful, heedless childhood at all, but it's full of such beautiful, beautiful images. And I have the post up on my wall by my bedside. And I see it every night before I go to sleep and every morning as I awake. A beautiful, beautiful picture of Fern Hill with the apples all green and golden and the horses nuzzling and whinnying one another. The farmhouse, the chapel, the foxes. And of, of course, Dylan Thomas there, the small boy who relished it all, who was prince of the apple towns. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sorry, I must go, folks. You oh, enjoy you. yourselves the rest of the meeting, and thank you so much for giving yeah. me the opportunity yeah. to share that, because I did want to share it. It's so thank beautiful. You. Thank you very thank you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I can see Susan and Margaret have joined us now, so welcome to us to our poetry, poetry please. That was lovely reading by Mari, wasn't it? it? Was, yes, I must yes. say, I was reading that poem this morning in case she couldn't come on this afternoon. And it's not an easy poem to read. It's not, not at all, it's no. no. Well, yeah. I've, I've yeah. had a re- read, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know um, now that John, uh, John Ivinson has volunteered to read Leisure by W.H. Davis. So shall I hand over to you, John? Yes. Uh, and you can before I read that, in fact, I read one of my own poems. Yes. Uh, it's yeah, called the, the, the Winter Tree. Yes. Uh, I, I wrote this um, oh many years ago when I was 20 <laughs> in, in Yorkshire. I was in Yorkshire. I was Not in a park <laughs> in Huddersfield and um, I was looking at this tree and uh, this is what I wrote. <clears throat> After mass of beauty silhouettes the sky, gaunt and grey thy image formed by rude nature's hand. With what strange emotion the question does arise, why does all the splendors of thy summers die? Whither goes the majesty under autumn's rain? Alas, the shady canopy of multicolored vein. The past, however glorious, can never be sustained. The memories of a bygone age can never be reclaimed. Like mortals and their dynasties, Prolific or profuse, all bow towards the toll of time. None may make excuse. So in thy solitary existence, where death pursues its way, lift up thy withered profile and look beyond today towards the resurrection of coming summer days. Lovely. Very good, lovely. Very good. Very good. So uh, uh, that was many, many years ago, yes, sitting in right. a That's park lovely. in Huddersfield. Um, I've chosen leisure because we live in a very, well, not so much of recent times, but um, up until recently, uh, life has been so busy that we haven't had time to 
be still, to take in the, the beauty of creation, the, the, the joy of relationships. And so um, W.H. Davis's poem, um, a, a Welshman, of course, by the name, he lived as a tramp for a number of years. Uh, he married when he was 52, I think it was, to a, a nurse who was half his age. He had lived um, as a tramp in London and um, he died when he was 69. And uh, he wrote quite a number of poems, but he wrote uh, The Soul's Destroyer and The uh, Bird of Paradise. But this one, I'm sure we're all familiar with it. We learned it in school, but let me read it to you again. What is this life if for a care, we have no time to stand and stare? No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet, how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can enrich the smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if full of care, we have no time to stand stare. and stare. Yes, remember that one, yeah. Very nice, yes. And, and it seems that um, several of you this afternoon have chosen Welsh poets. But mm. I know that uh, on a lighter note that Susan has chosen uh, to read from Pam Ayres. Oh. Pam, Pam Ayres is a poet who's close to my heart because like me, she grew up in the Cotswolds as one of a large family. And uh, a few years ago, I used to travel to Southampton regularly to help my uh, daughter with the children. And I used to listen to Pam Ayres on on a CD as I was driving there and uh, she, she would keep me amused all the, through the journey. So I'm going to hand over to you, Susan, to, to read from Pam Ayres for us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I've chosen this poem partly because over the past year, I guess not many of us have had the opportunity to visit a dentist. <laughs> Happy I have. <laughs> <laughs> toothache, which resulted in the extraction of a tooth. Oh and the other reason I, I chose this poem was because you can probably tell that I'm not Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Wiltshire. Yes. It's actually only 45 miles from where Pam Ayres originates from. Yeah. And I've spent a good three years of my life with people telling me, oh, doesn't she sound like Pam Ayres? She sounds just like Pam Ayres. <laughs> So I thought, right, okay, then I'm going to read one of Pam's poems okay. now. So with apologies to Pam Ayres, this is, I wish I'd looked after me tea. Yes. Oh, I wish I'd looked after me tea and spotted the dangers beneath all the toffees I chewed and the sweet, sticky food. Oh, I wish I'd looked after me tea. <laughs> I wish I'd been much more willing when I'd much, when I'd more to bear than fill in, to give up Bob stoppers in respect of me choppers and buy something else with me shilling. <laughs> when I think of the lollies I licked, the licorice all sorts I picked, sherbet dabs big and little, all that our peanut brittle, <laughs> my conscience is horribly pricked. My mother, she told me no end. If you've got a tooth, you've got a friend. But I was young and careless. My toothbrush was hairless. I never had much time to spend. I showed them the toothpaste all right, flashed it about late at night, but up and down brushing, all that poking and fussing. Well, it didn't seem worth the time. I could bite. If I'd known I was paving the way to cavities, caps and decay, to the murder of fillings and injections and drillings, I'd have thrown all me sherbet away. 
So I lie in the old dentist's chair and I gaze up his nose in despair. <laughs> his dread and wine, these molars of mine, to amalgam, do you say, for in there. How I laughed at my mother's false teeth, as they foamed in the waters beneath. But now comes the reckoning. It's me they are beckoning. Oh, I wish I'd looked after me tea. <laughs> Brilliant. Awesome. Well done, Susan. Um, I got the I think impression I was um, listening to her. <laughs> I think it comes observations of life, which is, are just so close to us that yeah. make yeah. it so amusing. That they, yes. Well, yes. if you want something amusing, I should, if it hadn't been for the fact that we had driving restrictions here in Wales, I would actually be in the dentist chair right now. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see that thing on the WhatsApp group that the, uh, the man was playing his guitar, whatever, he lost his teeth and the dog found his teeth. Yes. <laughs> You see that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'm going to ask, ask Sandra now if she could read her choice of poem uh, in, in No Strange Land. Is that, am I right, Sandra? Yes. By yes. Francis Thompson. Yeah, I've, I've got two uh, short poems. Yeah? Um, yes. The first one is the serious one. It's by Francis Thompson. Um, and it's, it's in this little book called This Half Century. They're poems from the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and I did it for my O-levels in school. <laughs> um, now, Francis Thompson also um, had ended up as a tramp on the streets of London and used to uh, sleep um, near Charing Cross Station, I believe. Um, he, he was the <coughs> son of a staunchly Catholic doctor in Preston and had a good education. And his early intention was to become a priest, um, but that didn't come to anything. And he failed also to qualify uh, to get into the medical profession. And so he took up a number of dead end jobs uh, and had a, a growing opium um, habit. And I think that's what um, caused him to end up on the streets. But um, some of his poems are very spiritual and, and lovely. Uh, this is called In No Strange Land. O world invisible, we view thee. O world intangible, we touch thee. O world unknowable, we know thee. Inapprehensible, we clutch thee. Does the fish soar to find the ocean, the eagle plunge to find the air that we ask of the stars in motion if they have rumour of thee there? Not where the wheeling systems darken and our benumbed conceiving soars. The drift of pinions would we hearken beats at our own clay shuttered doors. The angels keep their ancient places, turn but a stone and start a wing, tis ye, Tis your estranged faces that miss the many splendid thing. Mm. But when so sad thou canst not sadder, cry, and upon thy so sore loss shall shine the traffic of Jacob's ladder pitched between heaven and Charing Cross. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry, clinging heaven by the hems, and lo, Christ walking on the water, not of Gennesaret, but Thames. Now, my other poem is the opposite of that. It's, it's very much a funny poem and very much tongue in cheek. It's written by Jenny Joseph and it's called Warning. Yes. When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat, which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. <laughs> and I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say we've no money for butter. <laughs> I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells <laughs> and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick the flowers in other people's gardens 
and learn to spit. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go or only bread and pickle for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the streets and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers, but maybe I ought to practice a little now. So people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I'm old and start to wear purple. <laughs> uh, so we'll look out for you in course. <laughs> Wearing purple. Uh, I'll be taking you into Killing Mad. Sorry. Council. We went to the O3. The O3 went to Lou one year. Yes. And in the hotel was a parrot. And we couldn't get that parrot to speak. And I was asked to read that poem. Oh, and when I, I started to read it, the parrot didn't stop. He didn't stop <laughs> all through it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> right, uh, well, uh, we've got another choice of uh, Welsh poet from Lorraine this afternoon. So should, shall I hand over to you, Lorraine, to read your Yeah, poems? okay then, yeah. Uh, and this time... To you, Margaret. <laughs> All right, I've, I've chosen two poems, so I'll read one for now. Vernon Watkins is, I only learned about him this year. He's a guy who was, um, he lived in, a uh, local guy lived on the Gower in Pennard, and he was um, a friend of Dylan Thomas as well. Dylan Thomas thought he was uh, the best poet he knew, and they met quite often in the Cardoma Cafe in Swansea. Yeah. And he, drew, he lived in a, a place called Hunts Bay, in just off Pennard, just off if at the west or the east cliff, I can never remember. And he wrote lots of lovely poems about uh, Gower. They're all they're all lovely, a bit long winded, so I won't read too one too long. So the two, two I chose. One was um, uh, an elegy to uh, Dylan, and one was about Swansea. And why I chose this one: trees in a town, because I used to be a community midwife in Swansea. Swansea before I became a nurse and then retired and I could relate to it it's about um he used to he worked as a before he became a poet he worked in a bank on St Helens Road don't know if you know it the way it ran across with Brynamore Road at the bottom yes. as well you know he worked in a bank there uh, for years before he became a well-known poet so this is about the trees that were outside where they chop the trees down two chestnut trees where they chop them outside the um the bank in lloyd's bank uh in uh, st helen's road so it, i think it was written in the 40s 50s sorry i can't remember so anyway i'll read it now why must they fell two chestnuts on the road i did not see the lorry and its load before a wall had grown where they had stood i wish i thought that sphinx like block was good Builders have raised to brood upon the loss of those two chestnuts where the two roads cross. In spite of all the gain some say has been, how can my eyes accept the altered scene? How often checked here on my way to work, by the instant luck of life I saw themes fork. Into the boughs where thought could learn as much, a sight will learn till it is taught by touch. In March abounding, sunlight drenched the tree, but still those sticky buds would not set free. Their secret fledgling silk of crumpled fronds held in the icy trance of winter's bonds. Summer's wide green brought gloom where eyes could range upon the dark foliage of attentive change. But soon that gloom was battered by a squall, then the long yellow leaves were first to fall. After in a frost, when all the boughs were bare, what sudden grace the trees would print on air. Call I the tree a book for men to read in any season and then ask what need. A four square building had to put, pull them down. I can forgive the traffic of this town. It's noise and brutal speed, but only just metal and brick and glass above the dust. 
Smile on the road and on the lawn between. What else is there the planners have not seen? A fig tree thick with fruit, fruit which never grows, ripe in our sun when June is hair it throws. Young yellow fruit to the pavement while unspent. The broad leaves thrive and spread a fertile scent. One memory of abundant nature's loins, the shriveled figs grow hard as ringing coins. Seeming to prove the toll gate has been paid, out of that garden to the builder's trade. How patient is the shadow those leaves cast. They rob the present who despoiled the past. In all utilities, cold eyes are seen. Beauty's profusion yields to what is mean. And yet a fallen leaf can still express man's exile, his lost innocence, his dress. Trees in a town, how long will they survive? The merchant's act for all that looks alive. How <coughs> shall miraculous blossom leaf and speed breathe life into the body lulled by speed? Racing to nothing in an asphalt place, something is lost, the trees obstructed grace. Seems to slick progress, wasteful obscene, whose highway must be useful and be clean. Yes, well done. Did, did you say you had two to read? There's or? another one, if you don't mind. Yeah, this one is a quickie one by, um, again, because every day, as we all do, we all go walking now. And I walk every day along the estuary mm. in Loch and uh, Binya. And I see curlews there all the time. And I love watching the curlews. And uh, apparently this is an allergy to Dylan when he died is one of his allergies. It's called the curlew. And because I love the curlews, and of course, as you mentioned, he was a friend of Dylan Thomas. Sweet throated cry by one no longer heard, who more than many loved the wandering bird and changed through generations and renewed perpetual child of its own solitude. The same on rocks and over sea I hear, return now with this unreturning year. How swiftly now it flies across the sands, image of change and changing, changing lands. From year to year, yet always found near home, where waves in sunlight break in restless foam. Although the cave is, this, out, this outlives, lives the cave, and the grey pool that shuddered when it gave, the landscape life reveals where time has gone, turning green, slowly forming tears to stone. The quick light of that cry disturbs the gloom. It passes now and rising from its tomb, carries remorse across the sea where I wait on the shore, still listening to that cry, which bears a ghostly listening to my own. Such life is hidden in the ringing stone that rests unmatched by any natural thing and joins and head the wave crested and the wing. Now with Vernon Watkins, with his, his Jim Taliesin in Gower, you can, when you read, I had to read his poems a couple of times before they sink in with me. Yes. And when they do, you can really envisage what he's talking about, you know, yes. when I read him. When I read them, I thought, oh gosh. But when I read him two or three times, and because we know Gower and the birds and that, you can really relate to his uh, poetry. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I, I was watching the curlews on the banks of the river. Oh, I know, I love watching the curlews. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Margaret, I saw Margaret, yeah. just been to People Speak Up, I think you were there today. Hi. Right, well, and in fact, I'm going to ask Margaret now. I know Margaret's very keen to read some poetry for us, so yeah. shall I hand over yeah. to you, Margaret? Thank you. Oh, I love, I love poetry, and I'm enjoying all this. Good, um, good. What I've chosen to read. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear? Me? Yeah. Yes. When what what I've chosen to read is one that I wrote in July 1997, which is almost 24 years ago. Uh, the previous year, my husband had passed away, and that particular afternoon, I was down in Barryport, and my son and daughter-in-law live opposite the harbour. And I said to him one afternoon, I said, oh, I'm going for a walk. And I went down the harbour. So if you can imagine, come with me and see what I saw and how, what I thought of it. I called it at the harbour. The shimmering babbling waters, creating a melodious tune. 
the golden mounds of sandbanks with craters, just like the moon. A girl calls to his, to his partner. What message does it send? The endless sea around me. Where does it start and end? A child climbs over boulders. Dad sits baby on his shoulders. A smoker contentedly lights a match. And there's a fisherman waiting for his catch. The boats are bobbing up and down. I sit here as the sun goes down, a tranquil haven out of town. And when I'm lying in my bed, I'll keep this picture of Worm's head. When other things come to my mind, I'll try and leave them all behind and think of what I see just now. The beauty a few miles away, our local treasure in Carmarthen Bay. The scenes we see and the thoughts that dwell create our living, making it heaven or hell. As evening's falling, the girls are still calling and the boats are still bobbing and the river still babbling. And if tomorrow for peace I yearn, they will all be there if I return tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow I will overcome my sorrow with the beauty and the kindness of this world. And I like to think that that was my watershed. That was lovely. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 The other one I like to read. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, other, was... the other one I'd like to read was one that Graham wrote. I don't know how many of you knew Graham, but he yes. was quite a character. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he, he wrote many poems to me because wherever I was going, whatever I was doing, whoever I was with, he seems to be thinking of what is she doing now? Who is she with? What is she doing? And he'd write this poem. So when I'd come back and he wrote this first one because it was, I went with my family to Ibiza on a holiday and I, um, and there they had the, um, the games, which I joined in and there was a shooting one. So there I was shooting and I found out later then that there was a camera, um, the TV cameras were there oh. and they were gonna put it on Sky television. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't have Sky, but I was, I, but I was rehearsing on a Sunday night in Glenalla with the choir and Graham had television, Sky didn't hear. And it suited me for two reasons. For one thing, um, I wanted to see what was on, when this would be on, after the X Factor it was on the Sunday night. Mm. And I wanted to see it. The other reason was I didn't want to come home at nine o'clock because coming into an empty house and everybody knows what it's like. Coming into an empty house a couple of hours before going to bed, saddened. And by going over to Graham's, I had a, a couple of hours there. And this is what he, he started, he wrote, the first poem he wrote for me. Sun, Sunday is a coming and my heart is all afire because Margaret is coming after singing with the choir. Her radiant presence and wide counsel are always in demand, but I know I have to share her with other friends in her clan. These same days of waiting are the longest I've had to spend. I'm glad to do some taping. It stops me going round the bend. Mm -hmm. And now I know that Margaret's are coming to spend some time with me, just we two together. And of course, our little Fluffy, that's the cat. Sometimes he will sit between us, contented to be amongst friends, like a cherished first edition between two fine bookends. <laughs> but now or less you'll find him sleeping at Margaret's feet, dreaming of his lady pussy and enjoying his own special treat. <laughs> All too soon, Margaret says, she is going. Homeward bound, she'll wend. I hope our time together wasn't boring. Oh, God, 
Did it have to end? <laughs> I hope I've been attentive and dutiful to be the one and only special friend. Because her, cause she rhymes with everything that's, that's beautiful. As our similar interests form a perfect blend. That's the yeah, first one good. he wrote to me. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I won't yeah. give you any. And you can Very really visualise that, can't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, yeah. yeah. if you're new, um, you can visualise it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now is the start of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. 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 Very mm. good. Yeah. Christine, did you want to read anything? Has she uh, gone? Chris is gone. Gone. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what yeah. about you, Mena? Did you want to read anything to us? No, no, thank you. But I'm enjoying hearing all these. I love them. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's thank you very good. much. Yes. Well, I, I've got a poem to read. Um, uh, as long as anybody has anybody else got anything else they wanted to read, I could read something from A. A. Milne if you like. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, reading skills not for, not uh, my best skill, but anyway, it's um, "Wind on the Hill" by A. A. Milne, who right. wrote uh, "Winnie the Pooh" and yes. a number of other yes. childhood books that I read many, many times in my childhood and could almost sort of fancy myself within the story. Um, but this one is about wind on the hill, so it's a really about wind. Uh, wind out there, not wind. There's a lot of character by that. <laughs> I've got an overactive imagination. Um, <laughs> No one can tell me, nobody knows, where the wind comes from and where the wind goes. It's flying from somewhere as fast as it can. I couldn't keep up with it, not if I ran. But if I stopped holding the string on my kite, it would blow with the wind for a day and a night. And then when I found it, wherever it blew, I should know that the wind had been there, had been going there too. So then I could tell them where the wind goes, but where the wind comes from, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and very appropriate after a very stormy night. Yeah, yeah very appropriate, yeah. <laughs> um, another, another one I remember from childhood was Now We Are Six. Yes. Um, this is very short. When I was one, I had just begun, and when I was two, I was nearly new. When I was three, I was hardly me. And when I was four, I was not, not much more. And when I was five, I was just alive. And when I was six, I'm as clever as clever. So I think I'll be six now, forever and ever. <laughs> and I hasn't changed. And I haven't changed a bit, no. <laughs> I've still got a six in my age. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll probably be greedy by the time I have my next birthday because I'll be 66. Oh, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, um, I, I've got a, a poem to read, um, which I, I first heard at the start of the pandemic, um, and it was called And People Stayed Home, and it's allegedly written by a poet called Kathleen O'Meara and was said then to have been written in 1869. Now, since then, people have, been, have disputed when this was written, but whatever, I, I think it's uh, very appropriate for the time mm. that we're living through. Yes. So it's, and people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened deeper. Someone meditated, someone prayed, someone danced, someone met their shadow, and people began to think differently, and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless, and heartless, even the earth began to heal. 
and when the danger ended and people found each other, grieved for the dead people, and they made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways of life. So I hope that- it's Very appropriate. Yeah. That's yeah. very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope that we will learn new ways of life and, and be able yeah. to meet up again soon. Yeah. I like yeah. that. When was that written now? Um, I like well, it. Uh, 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 if you look it up online, it says that it was written in 1869 uh, at the time of a famine. famine. Um, oh, yes, right. Yes, yes. yes, yes but yes, some yes. people have disputed that, so I'm not really sure. Of no, things. no. Yeah, what, what was the first line again? When, when uh, and, people... and, and people stayed home. And people stayed, stayed home. home. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's quite yeah. appropriate for today. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And then I've got another short poem, uh, because the thing that many of us have enjoyed during the pandemic is gardening. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a keen gardener. And my father gave me this little tiny book called Green Fingers, which he found in a, a junk shop, I think. He was always ferreting around junk shops. And this was written in the 1800s. But it's, what is a garden? What is a garden? Goodness knows. You've got a garden, I suppose. To one, it is a piece of ground for which some gravel must be found. To some, those seeds that must be sown. To some, a lawn that must be mown. To some, a ton of cheddar rocks. To some, it means a window box. To some, who dare not pick a flower, a man at 18 pence an hour. To some, it is a silly jest about the latest garden pest. To some, a haven where they find forgetfulness and peace of mind. What is a garden, large or small? It is just a garden after all. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One, one thing I do think of this time of the year, but there's not many of them out now, uh, Wordsworth, uh, the daffodil, you know. Yes. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Yes. 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 Yeah. All at once I saw a crowd, oh, a host of golden daffodils. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Some say he was high when he wrote that. Yes. I hadn't realised when I was in school, I thought he was just talking about, you know, daffodils we see in the garden, but apparently he was, uh, no, they yeah. used to take opium. And I think he was on a trip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when, he's when he's floating and watching these daffodils. Yes. Uh, you know, it's uh, not just what he sees, it's uh, oh, what it's in his mind. the opium as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think Coleridge and Wordsworth and all of those, they were, they used to double in yes. opium. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why so many of them died young and, and died of things like tuberculosis, didn't they? They did, yes. 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 I think Francis Thompson died of tuberculosis eventually yes, because and, of and John Clare. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. 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 Did anyone have any anything else they wanted to contribute this afternoon? I would have looked at more, really. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to have another Can I read another one of Graham's? Yes, please, yes. Shall I read another one of Graham Hill's? Yes, please, Margaret. The silly poems, right? Yes, yes. I, always, I always say the, the situations are true, but the wild imagination is, is ridiculous. <laughs> it's so exaggerated. Yeah. A day at the risk. Margaret's been to Ascot to have a day of fun. Um, there to see the... I can't read it very There to see the fashions and watch the horses run. I'm sure she made a profit when the mare she backed it won, not mm -hmm. one of the favourites, but on an outsider at five to one. <laughs> I was hoping to see her on telly talking to Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> Discussing friends and family and, and places where they both had been and comparing both their palaces, neither of which I've seen. 
and inviting Liz and Philip to Bethania, sorry, for strawberries and cream. <laughs> I bet she spoke to the Aga Khan as well as, well as his jockey too. He, he dressed in silken colours and standing oh, just five foot two and eyeing all the wealthy Arabs who, who were his, whose intentions now, now ring true. You uh, many, many or something, uh, oh, mm -hmm. oh, too many a British princess and cockatoo to the Jew. <laughs> I'm sure Margaret, I'm sure Margaret enjoyed the day despite the, 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 um, the in, in, oh, beside the wet, wet hat and feathers because she would look lovely in all sorts of weathers. I'm sure <laughs> that outfit topped the pole. <laughs> and indeed, and indeed, whatever. She'll tell me all on Sunday night when I hope we'll get together. <laughs> <laughs> Here is your Shakespeare. Pardon? <laughs> Here is your Shakespeare. Pardon? <laughs> oh. Well done, Margaret. I got a book for them. <laughs> <laughs> I got a book for them. <laughs> right, well, it, it's uh, just gone 10 to 3, so probably a good time to be winding up and go for a cup of tea, I think. So. Thank you, Sarah, for Thank hosting you, Sarah. that. Can yeah. we have another one yeah. here sometime in the future, please? Yes, if you would like to, yes. I yes. 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 I really like the opportunity, Sarah. Um, certainly one I think it would be good uh, to repeat uh, sometime during Advent. Yes. So that we could have some Christmas poetry. That's a good idea. Um, yes. But I and perhaps then we can we'll be meeting in person and if, yes, be yeah. yes. 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 Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. We could get more <laughs> mince pies. Yes, good. <laughs> I'll make them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.